looks like we're good to go. So I am a, an extension forester with Purdue's Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and really appreciate the opportunity to present at your program today. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you about income opportunities uh, from your woodlands and having an opportunity to explore a variety of different possible income sources you can look at from your properties uh, to help you kind of meet, make meet ends. Uh, so a lot of folks, in many cases, uh, enjoy the opportunity to see how their property can help them pay some of the bills. But for many folks also, it's not an important part of property ownership, so we recognize that. Uh, so there's a lot of good reasons why you may want to actively manage your woodlands, including income, but actually beyond that too. And so one of the reasons that we look at is we can actually increase the productivity and health of our property. And that can be uh, for a variety of things, biological diversity, wildlife habitat, uh, general forest health, uh, beyond just growing more wood. Uh, if you do have specific benefits and products that you're interested in producing on your property, we can actively encourage those through management practices. Uh, and of course, many of you are here to think about income opportunities and we can derive income from woodland properties on those acres that in many cases are woodlands because they're not suited for other agricultural systems or uses. Uh, and so the fact that they can't be row crops certainly does not mean that they can't be productive. In many cases, they are highly productive and can in fact uh, offer us income that once we look at the income versus the expense balance can be very competitive with croplands in some cases. The other thing we've got to recognize on our properties is that natural processes uh, have been disrupted by both past and present activities and disturbances. And so the introduction of invasive species, the removal of some of the primary predators, uh, the change in balance that we've had between species, soil erosion have all created issues that oftentimes require an active hand in management for our woodlands to be as healthy and productive as they could be. One of the other things we can do with management is actually enhance plant and animal diversity. So if you're looking for additional wildlife viewing opportunities, you, you wanna see a wide diversity of plants and the associated insects and other critters that utilize those. In many cases, management helps us create that diversity on the landscape. And also oftentimes that's actually through disturbance. And so we have an opportunity to use active management to create enhanced diversity of a variety of plant and animal species on our properties. And while timber is, for most folks in most cases, the most ava readily available in terms of marketplaces, and also oftentimes the most lucrative source of income, there's a lot of other potential possibilities. And we will talk about those this evening. Almost no matter what direction you're headed though, one of the things I'm gonna encourage you to do is to seek some professional assistance on your properties. And there's a variety of places you can go to find professional forester assistance. Uh, a picture here is my friend, Pence Revington. She is the tree farmer of the year for Indiana uh, this year. She's used a variety of different foresters on her property to help her realize her management objectives, uh, provide guidance, uh, assistance with on the ground management, and generally help her move forward with what she wants to see accomplished on the property. Uh, and we encourage people to utilize those resources that are available for them in terms of that professional assistance. It just helps you avoid some of the problems and mistakes that are so common for folks that aren't familiar with what happens in the forest and how to appropriately manage it for their objectives. Uh, here in Illinois, uh, you can tap in to your uh, University of Illinois for direction to professional foresters. In Indiana, we have a dedicated website where you can find professional forester assistance. And there are a variety of different types of professional foresters you can tap into for assistance. Uh, and so for many folks, one of the best places to start are your public sector foresters working for your state department of natural resources. Uh, and these folks are your state private lands foresters, oftentimes also called district foresters. And there's typically one assigned to a multiple number of counties. And so they have a district that they work with private landowners in providing direction, assistance, and in many cases on the ground assistance, including maybe management plan writing uh, for landowners to start establishing their directions and then get additional resources 
and guidance on how to achieve those objectives. Uh, we have extension foresters like myself uh, that are working in education programs and also are available to help direct you to a variety of different resources. So if you're not sure who your private lands foresters are or how to get a hold of your state agency, you can certainly contact the good folks uh, at Illinois or here in Indiana at your land grant university uh, to get that direction and assistance. There's also uh, USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service foresters and foresters that work with other public agencies, oftentimes providing direction and assistance for landowners, uh, particularly with conservation practices for the Natural Resource Conservation Service programs. And in many cases, the services of these folks are free, but of course, what that also means is oftentimes there's a lot of demand for those services. So it may take a little while for them to get around to you, but if you can be patient, it's a great starting point. We also have private sector foresters that can assist landowners in a variety of different, uh, uh, different ways and with different approaches. And so one group that does an awful lot of the on the ground work are the private consulting foresters. And these are professional foresters that actually work as uh, contractors in essence for landowners, helping their, them achieve their management goals on their property. And so they're working directly for the landowners, typically on a fee basis. We also have industry foresters that are working for wood using or wood procurement industries or working on their own as a, a sort of wood broker, uh, but also offering forest management advice, direction and assistance, including things like timber sales. And then there's a variety of non-governmental organizations. One I think of is the Nature Conservancy uh, that oftentimes has foresters on staff working with landowners in a variety of the programs that they're emphasizing. Uh, this also includes some of the groups like National Wild Turkey Federation and a few others uh, that have act active conservation programs that they're utilizing uh, professional forestry assistance to work with landowners that are cooperating with them. So you can see you've got a lot of different outlets for assistance uh, in a professional context to help you direct yourself uh, with their assistance on how to get the, the best benefits out of your property. So what are some of the services you might expect from a forester uh, who's gonna work with you? And so in many cases, they're gonna offer you an on-site property review. And you can expect them to be asking some questions of you as they go along. So what kind of goals or expectations do you have for your property? What do you enjoy about your property? What are your plans for the future? Uh, they can offer a variety of management options and recommendations based on your property and the information you provide them. And then once you make some decisions about what direction you want to go, typically the next step is to start developing management plans. Uh, and so we can essentially tune those plans to meet your objectives based on the property, uh, the resources available, and the situations we need to, to manage and deal with to put that property in a position where it's going to be moving toward reaching your goals for that property. And this might include uh, marking and marketing and administering timber sales. Uh, so foresters can work with you oftentimes in the case of a consulting forester as your agent to help you through that process. Uh, you may have a situation where you want to do some tree planting to do a little additional reforestation or wildlife habitat development. And in many cases, they can develop the plans, provide advice, and actually in some cases do the plantings uh, on a contractual basis. Uh, there's a variety of woodland improvement practices, including invasive species control, thinning, pruning, uh, weeding that we can do in the forest, uh, oftentimes kind of lumped together called forest stand improvement that will improve the growth, productivity, potential of our properties and move us closer toward that position where we're realizing our objectives. Uh, another important area, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that is information on tax management. And so particularly when we sell timber, but also when we're doing some other activities, there's opportunities to reduce your property and uh, income tax liability based on your current situation. And foresters oftentimes can provide you direction on that. There may be situations where you need evaluation done in your property, either for an estate settlement or to set up what we call a basis for selling timber. Uh, so we can actually use that against income as a, a reduction in income tax liability. And so there's a variety of valuation tools 
and services foresters can provide in many cases. And then if they can't provide the services you're looking for, oftentimes they know people who can. And so they can provide referrals to you uh, to get additional professional assistance or on the ground help that you need for your management needs. Now, as we mentioned, uh, the primary folks that are actually going to be to help you with timber sales uh, are consulting foresters and industry foresters. And they're kind of coming from two, two different avenues in terms of this timber sale process on private properties. So the consulting forester is actually a person that is working for the landowner, oftentimes on a fee or commission basis. And they can mark and market trees for sale and essentially administer the whole timber sale process. And oftentimes they're marking trees based on your objectives, marketing to likely buyers, and then oftentimes setting up a competitive uh, timber sale process, uh, setting up a contract, and then overseeing uh, the, the operation to make sure everything's done according to contract. And they can also help you with the uh, tax and valuation issues as well related to that. So lots of services they're providing, but you're of course paying for those services. On the other hand, we have industry foresters who are typically purchasing forest products like standing timber logs uh, and also negotiating and marking sales and harvesting timber on private lands. Uh, and they also, in many cases, will offer additional management assistance too. You're typically not paying these folks, but you also have to recognize they're purchasing timber from you uh, as part of their business and trade. And either they're working for a timber procurement company or working on their own and reselling the timber to other folks. And so recognizing that difference will help you kind of evaluate uh, what services you need in what situation. One of the things we don't want to emphasize in timber sales is risk reduction. And so some of those best practices that will help us avoid some of the problems that many people will recount to me when they talk about some of their experiences with timber sales who have not taken some of these cautionary approaches. So the first thing is this is a sale of real property uh, and can have significant value. So you absolutely need to use a contract in this sale. And if you're working with a forester, typically you're going to have a contract available to you, particularly with a consulting forester. Uh, I'm a strong encourager of all trees that are to be sold should be marked both on the trunk and also on the stump. Essentially that stump mark is your receipt that that tree was one that should be taken once it is. And so marking all the trees to be in the sale is an important part of that. The other thing that is important for you to get the best value out of your timber sale is effective marketing to the folks that are be most likely to be interested in the material being sold. And that is something where a forester is going to be very beneficial because they are working in the markets on a regular basis and understand who would be most interested in your timber and how to market that effectively. I also strongly encourage folks to use a competitive process. And oftentimes this is in the form of a sealed bid sale where an advertisement is sent out uh, for bids to be made on this timber that has already been marked. They oftentimes have a month or two to have a look at the timber and then bids will be open at a set date, time and place. And the highest bidder has the opportunity in many cases with the approval of the lander and their forester uh, to, to buy that. And so that competitive process can give you, if not a fair market value, in some cases, even a premium market value. The other thing you wanna make sure that happens is you get paid in full before any timber is cut. Uh, oftentimes there's a schedule for a down payment and then a completion of payments for the timber. Uh, but it's important before timber actually starts coming off the property that all payments are completed in full. And that's simply to protect you from a company that might be in financial trouble or actually go out of business and you've got logs that have left your property, but you haven't been paid for them. And if that's the case, you may not get paid for them. So important that you get paid for all that material before you actually see that material hitting the ground. Uh, we typically in the contract have a variety of stipulations uh, outlining the conditions for logging. And so limitations on wet ground, limitations on access points, uh, timing, how much time they have to do the logging, any kind of closure periods that are necessary for property operations. And so those are all gonna vary from property to property, but that's something your forester can help you do is determine what those best conditions are. 
The other thing that's really important, and a, a good consulting forester friend of mine says it this way, is that one of the most important jobs he has is to set expectations, uh, both for the landowner, but also for the logger. And so he's acting essentially as an intermediary and a communicator, setting those expectations of what to expect from the sale, what kind of work we need to be doing, and then monitoring that to make sure all those expectations are met. And a lot of that involves significant communication back and forth. The other thing we're looking for are loggers and buyers that are appropriately licensed and bonded based on state laws, and also that they have training uh, both in safety and in efficient and safe operations on the property. So they're limiting risks to people but also limiting damage to your property as well. Now, you definitely want people operating our property to be well insured, uh, typically both for liability insurance, but also for workman's compensation because it is dangerous work. And once again, we wanna reiterate good communication back and forth between the forester, the landowner, and the logger. And uh, a website that you can actually visit that has multi-state information on selling timber is call before you cut. And I encourage you to have a look at that site. Uh, it also provides a lot of good information about managing uh, and really considering the situations for timber sales before you jump into that and maybe make some decisions you would regret later. So we mentioned that competitive process and this is an actual timber sale from several years ago. I've changed some names. Uh, so there was anonymity uh, still in place but you can see the difference in bids. And so if you don't have a competitive process and you're essentially accepting the offer that is given at the door, you don't know whether that offer is coming from buyer 19 and buyer, or buyer one. And you also, if you're not in a competitive process, even buyer one or two probably is not gonna offer you that higher amount if they're not thinking they're in competition with other buyers. So that competitive process can really help you get the true value out of your timber sale. And once again, that really goes to using professional assistance to get the very best results. Now I will say that that was a particularly high quality timber sale. Uh, here in Indiana, a normal timber sale might get uh, anywhere from four to six or seven bids in many cases. Uh, if we've got lower grade timber, it might be a little lower. If we've got really high grade timber, sometimes it'll attract quite a bit more interest. We did mention taxes and there are several tax considerations for timber sales. And so some of the things that you can consider uh, that can be advantageous for you in selling timber is uh, trees when they're sold may be taxed as a capital gain if certain conditions are met. And so typically if we're selling as a lump sum sealed bid sale, so all the trees for a set sum of money, uh, it typically would be eligible for capital gains treatment. And other types of sales can be if we do the right kind of, of tax gyrations and file the right type of, of uh, verbiage to indicate that. Uh, selling logs, oftentimes you may not be uh, eligible for capital gains treatment. So it's important to consider what the ta tax implications of how you're selling timber are. Uh, the other thing is that costs associated with the sale of the timber can typically be deducted prior to figuring your tax liability. So if you hire a consulting forester and you're paying uh, that forester for services, uh, if you have to have any uh, lines marked or any surveying done, in many cases, you can apply those expenses against the income and take that off of the total figure. The other thing you can do uh, is your capital basis in the timber can offset some of your tax liability. And so what is that basis? Well, that basis is the value of the trees when you either purchased the property or an inherited the property. Uh, and that is a little more complicated than it sounds. You're typically going to need a forester to help you figure out what that basis is. But once you've got that basis, you can once again have your forester help you do this calculation you can figure out how much of that basis you could apply against the income you get from the sale to once again reduce your income tax liability. So it can be an exercise very worthwhile to do, particularly if you've not held the property for a particularly long period of time. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, a lot of this information and much more 
is available at the uh, National Timber Tax website. And so this uh, web address at the bottom, uh, to get more familiar with that process, I'd certainly encourage you to take a look at that site. It'll give you a lot of good guidance on the tax issues uh, and the different things you can do to reduce your tax liability associated with timber and forest management properties. So I'm gonna transition now a little bit. We spent a fair amount of time on timber sales. Uh, I can spend two hours on that and we don't have that tonight. Uh, so I encourage you to look into that more. Definitely talk to your foresters a little bit about that if that's an area you're interested in. But I do wanna transition into some other areas of potential income and some other areas we need to think about when we're managing our properties. And one of those is that in many cases, we are really kind of doing catch up work from past mismanagement. Uh, and it may have been uh, intentional actions on a property. It may have been mistakes previous landowners made. It may have been the kind of natural, uh, didn't do anything because I didn't know what to do type of, of approach, the lack of management. But in many cases, we're having to do a little bit of extra work to get our properties back in the best condition they can be in. So some of the problems we face. Uh, grazing and burning histories can sometimes result in uh, hollow or damaged trees. Now we are certainly reintroducing fire as a tool in the forest in many places uh, and for very good reasons, but it needs to be rec recognized it's managed fire where we're in, uh, controlling the timing and intensity of those fires. In many cases past fires were unmanaged and we oftentimes saw significant damage from those to the quality of trees. Uh, heavy grazing can also do a lot of damage to trees through damage of root systems, lower trunks resulting in decay. Now, oftentimes on our properties, we have poor species or quality composition. And this is due oftentimes to either lack of management or what we call a selective harvests that have taken the best trees and left the rest. And what we really need to call that is high grading. It's really taking the cream out of the woods and leaving many of the lower grade trees behind. And this can actually look pretty attractive to a landowner when somebody offers to buy just a few trees for pretty high dollars per tree. The problem with this is that once that's done, uh, what's left behind is what you've got left to regenerate. And it's also what you've got left that's growing. And so your actual income potential in the future has been significantly reduced. <clears throat> so we really encourage folks to uh, work with a forester think about the long term to avoid that problem where we're just selling the very best trees and retaining really low grade, low quality trees that don't have as much future. Uh, we're all dealing with competition from invasive species and it's important that we do active management against that because many of these are so aggressive they can literally take over our woodlands. And some of us have dealt with those issues at, at, at great extent. We also have native vines like grapevine that can be competitive with our trees and they have certainly have a place on the landscape. But if they're at high numbers or in trees that we really want to see grow and do well, we need to do some control and management of those to reduce the numbers and reduce their impacts. And then in many cases, we've got woodlands that uh, are overcrowded and could actually be more healthy, more resilient and growing better with some active management through thinning and or harvesting. Uh, and so there's a variety of things that we can do to actually improve the overall health and productivity of these properties. So how do I actually go about some of this work? Well, the, the good news is that you can actually get assistance uh, from a variety of sources. And so the Natural Resources Conservation Service, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, has cost assistance programs, uh, as well as technical assistance programs available to forest landowners. Uh, and this assistance may be available to help you with thinning, with vine control, with invasive species control, pruning, planting, and lots of other conservation activities or concerns. Uh, and so if you foresee yourself doing some forest management on your property in the future, I certainly recommend you stop by your local, uh, they call it the USDA Service Center, typically one per county, uh, and contact that local Natural Resource Conservation Service office. Uh, let them know where your property is. They can give you an idea of what some of the programs are that might be available to you and even start the sign up process if that's something you want to proceed with. 
And if you like to do some of this kind of work yourself, which oftentimes I've done, uh, you can sign up for some of these programs and actually do some of the work yourself or under the guidance of your forester. Uh, that's what I did on my own property and provided some sweat equity to get some work done, but also got some cost share assistance uh, through these programs. Uh, and these are provided because Woodlands provides so many social and environmental benefits uh, that it's considered a, a community benefit to have this kind of good management happening. So you can certainly take advantage of that on your properties. And it's a great way to save money. And in some cases, if you're doing the work, even make a little bit of money. Another thing to consider is salvaging uh, products in the forest that may be in terms of volume or quality might not be saleable for normal timber sales but nonetheless could be utilized depending on what kind of interests or capacities you've got for crafting uh, or for market outlets. And the good news is that there's a variety of portable uh, sawmill and band mill companies that can actually refer you to folks that have bought in their products. And one of them I'm gonna plug, uh, it's an Indiana company based right here in Indianapolis, is the Woodmiser Company. And if you go to their website, they can actually, uh, they have a list uh, that they can refer you to a local custom sawyer. And so a person that could potentially come to your property and actually custom saw logs or lumber uh, to your specifications with the materials you've got. And so that's certainly a neat option uh, for producing kind of homegrown timber that you could utilize yourself. They're also more than happy to sell you these sawmills uh, if you've got quite a bit to do. And I know several people that have purchased these, done a big product and actually resold them for not very much less than what they bought them for. So uh, that's another interesting approach. Some of the products uh, that we get out of these, is, it's really an interesting area. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this uh, live edge slab market for countertops, tables, and a variety of other sources. And uh, some of the more attractive woods like black walnut, black cherry, the oaks, or woods with a lot of figure or staining in them are very popular for that. But there's a variety of species that can certainly be utilized and actually some pretty good values. Uh, this is actually a retired professor from Purdue who now runs a slabbing business, and you can say, see that he's uh, uh, selling pretty good material there for pretty good prices. And I'm even more amazed at some of the other things that are for sale that uh, typically I would have thought would have gone into the stove or the, uh, the wood pile out back. But nonetheless, with some of the new techniques, this material has a market and actually gets utilized. And this is what it's being utilized for. Uh, some of these epoxy filled uh, tables and countertops where they're essentially creating a little stream or another landscape in these. And you can use wood that typically would have been pitched in the stove or literally thrown away uh, for some of these projects. So there's some interesting opportunities depending on how much work you want to do and how much equity in terms of sweat and additional uh, effort you'd like to put into this material. Uh, other parts of the tree that oftentimes get left behind in harvesting operations, uh, crotches, smaller limbs, uh, defective sections, uh, very branchy areas have potential to be turned into useful products. Uh, so crotches and burls all have really unusual figured wood inside of them and oftentimes can find marketplaces for folks that are doing uh, turnings or special craft items. So this is uh, the crotch wood of a black walnut where two or three limbs have come together and formed this really fantastic grain. Uh, highly figured black walnut piece turned into a gun stock. Uh, a wavy grain burly piece of wood turned into a wood turning. Another example of a burl made into a wood turning. And you can see it's not even uh, solid wood. They've actually used some epoxy fillers in there. And in many cases, they don't care about that at all. Uh, there's quite the marketplace for these on places like eBay and a variety of other outlets. Uh, so kind of the sky's the limit, depending on how much energy and effort you want to put into collection and marketing. And then if you're a crafter, uh, some additional work on in terms of your own input into that particular piece of wood. And of course, it's not just limited to uh, what we would normally consider a, a wooden uh, products or, or practices. It can be a variety of materials we collect in the woodlands. Uh, so this uh, uh, pine cone and nut wreath uh, a woodcrafted chair uh, with grapevines and uh, a variety of small 
stems and twigs utilized for putting that together. Uh, great use for grapevines if you're cutting grapevines in your property. So uh, once again, kind of your imagination is the limit in terms of what possibilities exist if you're a, a crafter uh, in these areas. Another really interesting area is the uh, area of forest farming. And so this is the idea of growing crops or producing products in the shade of a forest environment. And there's lots of different possibilities and options. And so in some cases, it would, could be uh, specialty food items. So I think about things like shiitake mushrooms or ramps, which we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. Uh, can be herb, herbal medicine products like ginseng or golden seal. Uh, or ornamental products. Uh, so it might be fern fronds, running cedar, uh, different colored twigs from a variety of shrubs. Uh, once again, uh, really depends on what kind of market you can find and develop for these different types of materials. And there's some really good resources on this uh, through the extension.org site on forest farming. And also the US Department of Agriculture has forest farming uh, websites. And many of these have great guides and videos associated with a bunch of different options that you could look at, depending on what you might be interested in and what kind of resources your property has available. So some of the food items that you might consider collecting and or uh, actually doing active management toward on properties, uh, persimmons, pawpaws, wild plums, uh, the blackberries and raspberries, crab apples, juneberry, uh, lots and lots of different opportunities. Uh, the nut producing trees, walnut, hickories, and pecans, hazelnut, <clears throat> if you can find them, butternut, becoming pretty rare on the landscape now. Uh, if you're planting them, you might even have chestnuts available. And then, of course, uh, the syrups uh, and the saps. And it's not just limited to maple. Uh, we've got people that are actively collecting and making black walnut syrup, uh, birch, and I've even heard some stories about sycamore, although I hear it's not easy. Uh, maple is really the king because it probably yields more and has a higher sugar content than most of these other trees, but there's market opportunities for all of them. I had my first taste of black walnut syrup uh, this spring and would highly recommend it. Uh, just be careful that you're not tapping those high quality veneer trees. Uh, pick some old fence row trees or things that aren't going to be going into really high value wood products. And then edible plants, uh, so wild greens, uh, a variety of roots and tubers, and other plant parts are possibilities uh, in terms of wild edibles. One of the things to recall though is that if you're going to be selling this material or preparing it and selling it, you need to be checking local food, food preparation and sales laws to make sure that you're meeting local uh, health department requirements. And you can oftentimes start with your local extension office and your local health department to make sure that you are meeting those requirements and that you're not going to be running afoul of local laws and ordinances. So just an example of the diversity of products that you might be able to work with. Uh, black walnuts, and uh, I do recommend either wearing gloves or just accepting the fact you're going to have brown hands for a couple of weeks. Uh, the husks uh, produce a really strong stain. Uh, black raspberries on the upper right, persimmons lower left, pawpaws lower right, and many others to boot. And so we can do wild collection of these products, but oftentimes if folks are wanting to, to actually get into sales or make a, a larger volume, you're doing some intentional management to favor the growth and productivity of those plants on your property. So it might be doing some thinning around uh, those desirable plants or even planting additional plants. Uh, so in this case, we've got black walnut and also some oaks have been planted into a forest opening. And the landowner has gone so far as to provide some electric fencing to protect them from deer browse. And that's a good thing to keep in mind if you're going to be uh, kind of doing a high value crop production is uh, if you're in an environment where there's a lot of wildlife, that's food value for them too. And so what kind of measures do you need to use to protect your investment and get as much out of it as you can? So we mentioned ramps, uh, also called wild leeks. Uh, this is an early spring perennial. It's related to things like onions and garlic. And it was well known in many communities for being one of the first greens up in the spring. And so there's actually festivals surrounding this in the Appalachians. Uh, we typically find it growing in well-shaded and pretty moist hardwood forests. Uh, I see it 
infrequently in Indiana, it's around. Uh, as I go further north in the state, I tend to see more of it. I spend some time in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It seems to be everywhere up there. Uh, so it can either be quite common or in some places pretty rare. Uh, but it's becoming uh, something that's under demand from the uh, food industry, particularly kind of the higher end foodies who are interested in some unusual but tasty things that are seasonal in nature. And this certainly is. And so it's both leaves and tubers are edible. But we do want to be thinking about uh, sustainability in terms of management and harvesting because it's a crop that takes uh, seven to 10 years to mature from seed. And so it's certainly one of those long lived understory forest plants, but also really beautiful. So there's a variety of resources you can tap into if you're interested in growing or cultivating ramps. And so if you've already got them in your woodlands, there's opportunities to do cultivation of those patches and harvesting. Uh, if you don't have them, or if you wanna enhance the populations, you can grow them from seed from transplanted and divided bulbs. Uh, and also uh, you can do sustainable harvesting. And so in some cases, folks are just harvesting the leaves and leaving the bulbs in place. And so they've got a continual harvest every year. Uh, some others are thinning out patches by doing some harvesting of bulbs and leaves and then allowing those patches to recover for a few years before they come back and harvest. But there are several sites that provide some great guidance on management of ramps as a food crop. Uh, and of course, one of the other things you wanna do is make sure that you've done your work in terms of finding those marketplaces that are gonna be interested in buying your product before you put a lot of energy into it. But there is quite a bit of interest out there. Uh, a variety of mushroom crops that can both be wild collected and cultivated. Uh, probably the cultivation side is a little safer uh, so things like shiitakes on our hardwood logs, and there are good kits uh, and supplies available for that cultivation. Uh, also a variety of other species, it's becoming more and more common to have a diversity of mushroom growing kits available. Um, some people are still very interested in wild collection, but of course, uh, correct ID is really important. It's not a good business plan to uh, poison your customers. So you want to make sure you are uh, absolutely positive about your ID. There's a, an old saying that I always tell myself in the spring when I get ready to collect mushrooms, and that is there are old mushroom hunters and bold mushroom hunters, but not both. So that, that ID is a, a key part of your collecting. So we've got shiitakes in the upper left-hand corner on hardwood logs, and you can actually see where they've been, uh, uh, had the plugs, little holes drilled in the wood, and the plugs put in to culture that shiitake growth. Um, this is uh, lower left called chicken of the woods. It's a natural decay fungi in hardwoods, uh, very edible, but there are some species that look somewhat like it. So you need to know the differences. And then of course the famous morel mushrooms. We also have a variety of shade loving uh, plants that uh, have uh, some medicinal uses. And so one of the best known is American ginseng. Uh, and has huge markets, uh, particularly overseas in, the, in uh, Asia, uh, for the roots, but also other parts of the plant. Uh, but also golden seal, sometimes called yellow root, is another one that's collected. And there are a variety of others. Uh, blood root and a few others uh, of our forest understory plants have some marketplaces uh, for this medicinal or, or herbal remedy plant marketplace. It's important to recognize these species have specific growing condition requirements. And also <clears throat> in many cases, particularly for ginseng, uh, regulatory uh, rules uh, and laws that govern collection uh, cultivations and sales. So uh, once again, important to understand both the requirements of the plant, but also your requirements to operate in a legal manner associated with collecting uh, and cultivating these plants. So ginseng, uh, there's some regulations that you really need to pay attention to with ginseng because it is closely regu regulated due to declining populations because of over harvesting. And so most states have collection and sales regulations related to ginseng. And I've provided links here for both Illinois and Indiana. Uh, typically there's collection seasons in the fall and then an extended sales season that'll oftentimes go into the winter. Outside of that, no collections and no sales should be taking place. And uh, the, uh, this 
plant actually uh, practically every part has some saleability and so it's not just the uh, the, uh, the roots that tends to be the most valuable part but in some cases the seeds uh, and the tops will also have marketplaces but there's also significant regulations from state to state on how and what can be collected and so in many cases uh, plants have to meet an age or size restriction for harvest. Uh, you oftentimes are required to replant seeds where you've collected plants, and that's a good practice, even if it's not required because it maintains the, su the sustainability of those plants on the landscape. Uh, you also, in many cases, have seasons where it's legal to collect, but outside those seasons you cannot, and seasons where it's legal to possess and sell, and outside those seasons it is not. And depending on the state here in Indiana, uh, collectors are not required to be licensed, but purchasers are. Uh, I believe perhaps in Illinois and some other states, both are required to be licensed. And so that's something you wanna check on before you just start working with this plant. Uh, if you don't have native ginseng on your property, uh, you can buy stratified seed. That's a seed that's been treated to break a seed dormancy. It's planted in the fall and will typically germinate in the next spring. And so you can actually introduce ginseng to your property. And there's a variety of resources that can help you with understanding where and how to plant that effectively. Uh, you can even buy young roots from a variety of sources if you want to get a head start, although they are significantly more expensive. And I've had some issues with them not performing as well as seed in terms of the amount of plants I get for my investment. Uh, the other thing you can do is collect seed from adult plants and plant them in the general area of the parent plant to expand the populations. And that's a nice way to, for free, start growing your population of ginseng. And there are a variety of ways to grow ginseng. And so what's oftentimes considered the most desirable in terms of value are the actual wild roots that have grown for many years um, without any kind of cultivation and are collected. But we can also do what's called wild simulated, where we simply plant seed in likely locations to grow ginseng and let it grow just like it would in the wild and then collect it. Uh, there's other situations, and one of the first photos I showed you was one of those where we've created beds, but we're growing it in the understory of a forest in the shade that it requires. And that would be called woods grown. And then there are some places, and I've seen these in uh, Wisconsin, where they're actually cultivating ginseng in beds under shade cloth in a farm type environment but those oftentimes have the lowest value per pound of root. And this is another long lived product, uh, seven to 10 years from seed to harvestable roots. And oftentimes your highest value roots are significantly older. Uh, so it's not gonna be something you're gonna get income out of tomorrow, but something that can be planted in the understory of your forest and perhaps harvested later as a source of income. Uh, one caution, it's very attractive to poachers. And so it's one of those situations where you wanna not tell people it's out there and keep an eye on your property and make sure you don't have a poaching incident. As I mentioned, lots of resources for uh, growing uh, uh, ginseng, uh, how to cultivate it, some of the considerations for cultivation. Uh, these are well worth looking at because ginseng is a pretty picky crop. Uh, it has a lot of issues if it's not in the right sites. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen to it anyway. So it's not going to be a get rich quick issue, but it certainly can be uh, something that can provide some significant additional income on your properties over a, a longer period of time. Uh, another plant very similar to ginseng is golden seal, also sometimes called yellow root. Uh, it, in many cases, is very similar to ginseng. Both the roots and the tops are, sal are saleable. Uh, there oftentimes are some regulations related to the collection of sale of yellow root, and it grows in many cases in some of the same kind of locations in forest understories. Uh, and so it's another possibility, and seed is available for purchase for this one, uh, but you could also certainly collect seed and replant uh, to provide patches. And I have found a few patches of golden seal in Indiana, so it is certainly out there. Uh, another significant source of income for many folks now is uh, the pay to hunt or leasing hunting rights. Uh, and people will certainly pay for the privilege of hunting on your property. The amount that they pay uh, oftentimes depends on the conditions of the hunt. And so what's the quality of the hunting in your area? 
Uh, are there amenities that are available like a campfire site or even a, a cabin or a tent site? Uh, how exclusive is the hunting rights? Does anybody else hunt the property? Uh, are you not even gonna be on the property when they're hunting? So there's several conditions that can actually raise the value depending on what kind of uh, uh, hunting experience you decide to offer. And now uh, in association with that, there are several companies that actually specialize in managing leasing and hunting for landowners. Uh, and you can simply search on hunting leases in your state and there are a variety of companies that actually will help you help you connect to hunters that are looking for land to lease and help you with that leasing arrangement, of course, for a cut. Uh, if you're interested in doing this kind of arrangement your own, uh, you can oftentimes find agreements. Sometimes with uh, state fish and wildlife divisions, we'll have hunter agreements that you can utilize uh, or uh, look online and find some, uh, some hunting lease agreements and then make sure perhaps with some legal counsel that that's gonna meet your needs. But uh, it certainly is a source of income that many folks, particularly with larger land holdings or land holdings that they're not on often uh, can have. And it, it can be some other benefits. Uh, so if you've got a good set of hunters, you've also got eyes on the property to watch out for vandalism, trespass or any other problems. Uh, and you may even be able to get a little bit of management work out of these folks in many cases with an arrangement. Uh, to help that have them help you manage the property effectively to make it a better hunting property also. Uh, another big advantage I see for hunting is that in many places in the landscape, we've got more deer than is healthy for the forest or for forest regeneration. Uh, so this is a property uh, that Purdue owns just outside of campus, uh, planted in 2008. This photo was taken summer 2010. The only difference between one side and the other is one side is fenced to keep the deer out and one is not. So uh, having a, a deer reduction practices on your properties can really be a benefit to forest regeneration and also the general uh, habitat health of your property. And particularly having does taken uh, is important to keep those deer numbers at bay. The other thing that some folks are finding re recreation uh, and income opportunities is from uh, recreation opportunities offered on their property. And so the pandemic drove a huge number of people outdoors to find things to do. Uh, and essentially, in many cases, overloaded our public recreation facilities. And so there may be opportunities for offering private recreation opportunities and experiences on properties uh, for some income. And depending on the types of experiences you're wanting to offer, uh, the quality of experiences available on your property, it could be a significant source of income. Uh, one I think of that I worked with a landowner who, uh, mostly a forest landowner, but he had a little bit of, of uh, Creekside property that had some rock outcrops that had great fossil beds. And he actually leased those fossil beds to a collector for a significant amount of money a year. Uh, so just depending on the resources on your property, there may be some really interesting recreational or collection opportunities out there. One thing to consider, though, is if you're inviting people to your property, you need to consider protection against liability uh, for any accidents that could happen. So it's a good idea to look for a, an umbrella a liability insurance coverage on your property. Uh, even if you don't invite people to your property, that's still a pretty good protective measure. Uh, also, in Indiana, we have a uh, agritourism law that allows you to post a sign. As long as that sign is posted on the property where visitors can see it, it limits your liability when people are participating in what's called agritourism activities, which includes most of the things you would be doing on our property. Uh, if you don't have laws like that in Illinois, one thing you can look at is simply having visitor notices or even a liability release form for folks that you invite to the property uh, to pay for certain services or experiences. The other thing you want to do is check your property for potential hazards. So open wells, uh, trash piles that, that people can get into, any kind of problems that would create a potential harm or liability environment that you can address really should be. And then simply be prepared for accidents and emergencies. Uh, if anything does happen, you want to make sure that that experience is not a really negative one for the folks that are visiting your property. But having that appropriate insurance coverage 
and recognizing the need to address liabilities is an important part of having people come out to your place. So what I'm gonna wrap up with now is a, a relatively new area. It's been churning for a long time, but it's kind of back on the screen now for many people. And that's the idea of actually selling uh, carbon. And so the background behind this is businesses and many other entities are looking for opportunities to offset the carbon dioxide emissions that they are producing. And they're looking to do this in some cases by reducing their emissions, but oftentimes that's not possible or practical. And so they're looking to buy what's called offsets or carbon credits from somebody that is reducing carbon in the atmosphere, that they're actually sequestering carbon on a property. And if you're a forest land owner and you're growing trees, that's exactly what you're doing. And so you are, as you grow wood, 50% of wood is carbon. So every year that tree puts more wood on, it's putting more carbon on. It's sequestering that carbon out of the environment, out of the atmosphere. And when a tree uh, dies and goes back into the soil, part of the carbon in that tree is incorporated in the soil. Part of it is given off back in the atmosphere. When that tree is harvested, uh, part of that carbon goes into wood products, some of which can be very long lived. And so there's a variety of ways that you as a forest landowner are contributing to carbon sequestration and pulling carbon dioxide out of the environment. The question is, how can you get credit for that? So we've got these companies and entities looking to buy that. How do you get involved? Typically for smaller acreage landowners, it's been challenging. But there are some emerging programs for private woodland owners uh, that don't have two or 3,000 acres or more. Uh, historically, that was kind of the, the uh, lower level that you could get into just because of the costs associated with the management, uh, the, the measurements, and the actual auditing of the carbon that was going to be sold. So several companies now have developed programs where they're actually helping smaller acreage landowners enter these marketplaces. Uh, they are not, unfortunately, available everywhere. And there are a lot of variability between programs. Uh, typically, though, you need to recognize you're entering into a contract to deliver a certain amount of carbon captured on your property and retained there for a period of time. So you need to recognize that sometimes this does not operate in conjunction well with timber harvesting. Uh, so your ability to harvest timber and get that income could be impacted by selling the carbon accumulated in your trees in a carbon market. Uh, so there may be trade-offs there. And as I mentioned, each of these uh, schemes has different contract and timing requirements. And so it's really important that you look closely at what's being required of you in this situation. Several different options. Uh, there's a program being offered by the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy, uh, currently offered, I believe, in three states, soon to be several more, uh, some of the upper Great Lakes states and some additional states out east. Neither Indiana or Illinois is in this program area yet, uh, but may be in the future. Uh, so this one uh, is essentially what it's offering is payments for carbon for folks that delay harvesting or do management on their properties that can encourage additional carbon sequestration. So things that essentially make trees grow faster. Uh, good management, we would hope. Another group, uh, core carbon, uh, requires 40 acres or more. Uh, some not, I could not find a lot of details in terms of their uh, actual contract requirements, but typically it's uh, delayed or denied harvesting uh, to accumulate that carbon. Uh, forest carbon works, once again, 40 acres or more, uh, no extensive harvesting in the prior 10 years, and then significant limits or no harvesting going forward. So you need to recognize oftentimes if you're selling carbon in some of these schemes, you are giving up uh, wood sales. Another interesting one is Natural Capital Exchange, or NCX. Uh, they've recently been active in Indiana and actually offer programs nationwide, from what I understand now. Uh, it's an annual enrollment and a no acreage limit. And what you're doing is you're simply saying you're going to be deferring harvesting for the period 
that you have made an agreement with them, which is just one year. Uh, so it's an interesting approach. Uh, and they're doing essentially kind of an across the landscape view of this to apparently justify this as carbon sequestration. Uh, as I mentioned, there's been several contracts let here in Indiana. Um, unfortunately, the values have not been very high. Uh, I would say that uh, what I've heard is five to $15 per acre uh, is kind of what you could expect on an annual basis. And that's actually about the same or less than what you could typically expect with a good hunting lease. So not necessarily very competitive with what we might get off of some of the other ventures and certainly nowhere near what we might be seeing uh, in terms of the growth and value of timber for selling timber. Uh, oftentimes that is one to $200 per acre per year in terms of growth of those, uh, that tree value. Uh, of course, we're only collecting on that every 10 to 15 years when we have a timber sale. So some options available, uh, I would say the marketplace is not very promising right now in terms of the value versus the trouble that you may take on in terms of obligations and limitations. Uh, but depending on your objectives for your property, uh, what you're interested in doing versus what you're not interested in doing, this might be a viable option. And of course, you can include other things with this in terms of hunting leases and other opportunities. Uh, it's just important that you understand your obligations and the limitations that these contracts may set on you uh, and recognize that when you're entering into this agreement, they, uh, they expect you to deliver. And if you can't deliver, you may be refunding money uh, that you've gotten previously. So uh, important to read those carefully, understand what's being asked and make sure you're uh, comfortable with that commitment. So I would encourage you to, if you're thinking about income opportunities from your forests, uh, mull these over, see what might match up with you. Some of these might kind of mesh with some hobbies that you'd like to start or some natural interests you've got already. Or if you're wanting to be more hands-off, uh, professional assistance to help guide you through some of these things. But there's a variety of advantages you can accrue from this type of work. So in many cases, forest management is pretty low cost inputs uh, per acre. We typically have pretty flexible harvesting schedules, particularly for wood products. It's not like a corn crop that it's got to come out that season. Uh, we oftentimes have flexible management schedules. You can be working in the woods when you're not doing other things. Uh, if you're willing to put a little bit of sweat equity in, you can add some value by creating uh, value added products uh, or services from your forest environment. If we manage it well, it's oftentimes self-perpetuating. We continually grow more wood, uh, more forest understory plants, uh, more products. We can manage recreation to be sustainable and renewable. Uh, you have cost and technical incentive programs available to you through the U.S. Department of Agriculture and oftentimes your state forestry agencies. And so you can access those and those are going to help offset some of your expenses related to management. Uh, in many cases, you've got pretty good accessibility to marketplaces, particularly for wood products, but oftentimes for other things as well. Um, and there's an opportunity for diversification into a variety of different areas that you might want to manage your property for. And ultimately, we're also, by just simply having force on the landscape, offering a lot of environmental services, not just to ourselves in terms of wildlife habitat, uh, water um, control, soil building, uh, shade, wind breaks, but also to uh, our communities and society as a whole. So just a few ideas uh, that you can kind of think about in terms of what might work for you. Uh, I would tell you that I think probably for the foreseeable future, timber income is going to be one of the most easy and also most lucrative options. But there are certainly a lot of other potential ways that you can make some income off your property and also still manage your property effectively, sustainably, and have a very healthy forest. Uh, 